So the other thing that, um, the next thing that happened on discovery of being an empath was, uh, well, first of all, back, back then, so that was in 2008, and the word empath only existed in the context of Star Trek's um, counselor, Deanna Troy. And um, I remember watching Star Trek um, since the 90s and connecting with her um, on that, that level of knowing that I was similar to her and that she could sense things. And I felt ashamed of thinking that I might be as, you know, as cool as, as her because, you know, she was like this alien with the superpower. And to even think that maybe I was like that immediately made me just feel embarrassed and ashamed because it wasn't something that existed in our society. Now that shame and that embarrassment is actually a projection of society as a whole at the empath. So um, just like anything that's not scientifically proven, um, you're, you're feeling a collective energy in the culture of these belief systems. And when they oppress upon you, it makes you feel ashamed. And anybody can relate to that on some level, right? So um, it could be like your dress is too short and the majority of the people in society don't like you to wear dresses that short and and why would that be um because i can't wear them that short might be going through their head my mom didn't let me because her mom didn't let her and this is a whole trickle down of kind of shame and embarrassment that somebody comes along and breaks and says we can have dresses above our ankle now and it seems like taboo and oh my gosh and that one person starts to trickle out this new belief that says hey, uh, just because my dress is above my ankle doesn't mean I'm a slut. And um, and on we go. So that's kind of just, you know, one little titch of a sample that's really obvious. I mean, because you know anybody with a dress above the ankle doesn't matter now. But if I said a dress that shows your bottom, where's the taboo in our culture now? So we're always reaching to kind of open things up more. Um, as an empath, you feel that collective pressure more than anybody. Um, so what happens is um, rebellion. So if you grow up Mormon, you know, who are the dancers and the stripper clubs? Drop out Mormons or drop out, you know, Catholic girls. Um, a lot of the rebellion comes from that, you know, that if you think of like a pressure cooker with that escape valve on top, and if you press it, there's a lot of steam that comes out really, really fast. Now, as long as you don't press it, press, press it, it'll stay in that container and cook everything in there, right? And and keep keep contained. But the minute it gets pressed, and what presses, what presses that? So something presses us allows for that rebellion to come out. And a lot of times that's, you know, where we're pushed into a corner, so to speak. So um, as an empath, you feel all these um, energies and that sensitivity more. And so sometimes you can be more rebellious because that pressure is felt more. Whereas somebody who's kind of tuned out, and numbed out, isn't rebellious because they're not feeling that pressure and it's not because they're not feeling it it's not even created so um so yeah going back to you know star trek deanna troy so when this word started to kind of blurp up in society and i was um starting to become hypersensitive after my jedi training it wasn't just the uh jedi training i had also spent a lot of time listening to Monroe Institute's Gateway series. That series was developed in the 50s. And what it does is it puts your brain into a, um, a synchronization, right brain and left brain. So you experience and process 
as much in whole as is possible. Whereas normally we're just processing through our brain all the time on one side and we're not experiencing and processing. So your creative brain, your left brain and your right brain are working together. And you could also say that's almost like put it can put you into theta states, beta states, gamma states, which are superpower states. And these are all states that you don't normally experience unless you take drugs or maybe you do a lot of exercise and chemicals start coming up and putting you into different ecstatic states. Um, you can also get those states through meditation or just because you're focused on doing something you love. Um, but those states are um, accessible by manipulating the brain, you could say, with wave sounds that come in. And I went through um, kind of an addiction to this gateway. It was actually the Focus 10 that I just replayed and replayed and replayed and replayed because that's the one that made me feel really comfortable. And I would take long walks and listen to it while I went to sleep at night. And then, you know, I didn't worry about work or whatever. This was way back and I think I started listening to those in 2006 and seven. And then um, by the time, you know, 2008 was kind of wrapping around, I was into the Jedi stuff that just initiated me into all of that faster. Um, the Gateway series, if you look it up, it also has, oh my gosh, it's got um, a whole, um, they were CDs at the time that were developed, or at least the ones I had before that, you know, you had to go to their clinic and lay in a, in a sa private sound room on like a, um, a sofa type structure in kind of a, a like quiet place and have two speakers on either side of your head. Now we can just earbuds and boom, we're there. And it's really easy. So you can look up stuff on YouTube or wherever and, and get this the stuff and it will greatly help you with your psychic training and your skills. So for me, when I, um, because I had done all of that and it um, included in the series is remote viewing training. And, you know, it starts out with, I know I am more than my physical self. That's the first question that you call in to be answered. So you have this massive out of body experience and it confirms like, whoa, something else is going on out there. So it doesn't matter how much of a skeptic you are, if you have a desire to understand that. So people that are involved in physics and stuff, they have that kind of link between science and just a passion for knowing more. And so they often can still experience some of these states. Also, in addition to like remote viewing um, and out of body and all this training that's put into your subconscious so you can do this stuff and it, it you know, works. I mean, yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell more as I go on and, and talk, but getting back to just the empath and the nature of the empath and how that started to come in at that point for me. So while I was um, processing how my energy reflects with another person, I had to understand something. So I started to test it. I, I, I was still kind of angry and upset because if it's true that I'm just a reflector of somebody else's energy, then who am I? And, and what am I? Like, am I, is that all I am? Is it just a mirror? And so I started to look for answers with that. And I remember at one point I was sitting in Barnes and Noble. I was already traveling at that point. So I had become um, nomadic for 10 years and my aesthetic life, meaning poor life, where you own nothing, you have no possessions and you wander, you have no address. So I, um, I was, I did have possessions because I had a laptop, but I was sitting in Barnes and Noble in California somewhere. And there were two men near me. One was kind of in, out in front of me and the other one was over here on the side of me. 
and he was sitting next to me at a table. I had my coffee and I was looking through the books, usually spiritual based books and things like that. And he kept chuckling and laughing and he was having a good time with himself. And so I kind of looked back like, you know, what are you up to back here? Because he all, like he was putting off this thing of like, this is so good. I got to share this. I got to share this. I want to, I got to tell someone. So I said, you know, kind of look back like, yeah, you know, I'm here. Share with me. So he starts telling me that he's writing the screenplay of Prometheus. He was a big, handsome, black male, gorgeous guy, friendly, funny. We interacted quite a bit just for a few minutes while we were sitting there. And he told me a little bit about it. Well, then I could feel, you know, again, I say feel. I didn't even realize I was doing this so atomically. I was just automatically feeling people and responding around me. So I could feel the guy out in front of me keep looking up. And he was kind of irritated because he wasn't in on this, like laughter and this good time we were having. So I included him and said, and what are you studying? Because he obviously wanted attention. And he said he was working on, you know, learning from this book. And the book was about actually, I forget the title of it, but it was something to do with like, like almost something you would read if you were studying sales and you wanted to become the top salesperson and learn how to manipulate people, right? So he had this book and that's what he was working on. And um, as we interacted, I would have a good time with this guy. And when I turned to him, I would demean myself and I would say things like, well, I don't know, I'm not that smart, stuff like that. With this guy, I felt intelligent, um, friendly, happy, fun. With this guy, I felt, you know, like he he's he's putting out this energy, right? That's condescending. So what what do you feel like when someone's projecting that at you? You feel less than, right? So I started to see that, and then when I said, "I don't know, I'm not that smart," this guy, who was actually very wise, says. Now, why did you say that? And I said, oh, and we both pointed at him and went, cause he's projecting. And that was like a light bulb for me. So that was the second incident. And this time I wasn't angry, but it was very upsetting because it meant that I was responding. And then if that was true, then who am I? So I'm responding so friendly, happy, da da da, and this way with this guy, I'm responding this way with this guy. And both of them are giving me a sense of purpose because I'm involved and I'm responding. So even though that was a negative response with this guy, I still included him because that would give me a sense of purpose. So there's a shattering reality there when you realize you will even suffer so that you can have your purpose and somebody else can feel better than you or whatever they need to feel. And that's, that's the curse of the empath. So I'm really trying to nail this idea into any of the listeners because it's so important to know um, that you will do it in extreme cases that um, later you'll say, you know, why did I do that? You know, it could be anything from, you know, a straight flat out abuse, even physical abuse, um, to, you know, um, in this case it has to do with males for me, but with women, there's a different story that goes on. So when you start pandering to their energy, so let's say, you know, I had a book group and this is before any of this. This was way back. I left my own book group because um, I didn't like um, the the energy in the book group. And I kept feeling it all this competition and all this like, you know, um, women wanting to be better than each other. And, you know, and then like buying each other off sort of like, um, you know, like mean girls where it's like, you know, oh, you're on my team and so I'm gonna boost you up and we're gonna bring this one down over here. And 
and and this stuff had been going on my whole life and I had felt it um you know since I was a kid so in my own book group um I thought that because I created it that I would not have to experience that but I'm still the same person and I had created it in a democracy so um the loudest stinkiest one wins it's not about you know, who's the most righteous or who's the most kind or loving person that ever wins. It's always the loudest, you know, noisiest, most bully in a sense that usually gets their way. So what book are we going to read? It's not going to be me because I didn't designate myself as the queen. Had I said, I'm going to start a book group. I'm the queen. If you don't like what I pick, get out. Um, I would never have done that because as an empath, again, your purpose is to feel, sense, and become what everybody needs you to become so that you are still doing your role that God intended or so it feels. You think that's you. Um, you know, so, you know, I felt the bullying and felt all those things going on in the book group. And it was all covert, of course. Everybody's covert. Oh, we're all just happy women. And, um, and then, you know, it just taught me... I remember after that just saying I would never start a democracy again because um you know there is no such thing in a sense like you're always going to be dealing with who has the control who has the power and we see that in our society you can have a democracy but who has the money to market their ideas to and they're just ideas to get your vote they're not necessarily even truths like so it's like look I'm going to do this when I get elected and then they don't have to you know because they've been elected they can do whatever they want so um that's it for part two of this and topic about the empath and why I started the tree of life church and my journey on to mediumship and where it's going so <laughs> More later. Thank you.